Sorry. So what I'm going to do very briefly is just give you a quick chronology of this place uh, before I hand over to Her Excellency. So Skyville started, I guess, in European history with the dedication of the Nelson Common in 1804. Of course, as things go, um, a little bit later, Pitt Town was, was uh, started in 1810, so the name of the common changed to the Pitt Town Common. I guess that's a, um, a regular thing for... The Pitt Town Common continued until 1893, and in 1893, a part of the common was put aside for the cooperative farm. The cooperative farm lasted from 1893 to 1896, and from 1896 until uh, 1910, it then became the casual labour farm. From 1905 until 1910, as well as the casual labour farm, they started farm training for young boys. So the whole idea of all those enterprises was to get young boys, teach them how to farm, and put them back out on the land. It was very much a nation building exercise. Uh, during the First World War, uh, there was some 60 or 70 German nationals interned here in tents on the farm. And towards the end of the First World War, it became a farm training centre for women because most of the farmers, most of the men, were over on the front. So we needed women, as usual, to pick up everything and run it for us. Okay, in 1919, the Dreadnought Scheme started again and it continued until 1939. And these buildings, of course, were built in 1929. Towards the second half of this phase of the Dreadnought Scheme, there was more emphasis on bringing uh, Australian boys in here to train alongside the Dreadnoughts. And I have to say, we are very lucky today in that we have Tom Allport, who is 99, and he is a surviving Dreadnought with us today. And we also have Tom Drehar, who is 88, and he's an Australian farm trainer. Then, when the Second World War started, this immediately started being used for military training exercises, this area, and got serious with the um, anti-aircraft searchlight units that came here, the 67th of the Skyville Holding Centre, Migrant Holding Centre, which gradually changed into the Skyville Migrant Accommodation Centre, and that continued until about 1963. In 1964, the Australian Army started reconstructing the Migrant Accommodation Centre to accommodate the Officer Training Unit, which we've heard about a bit this morning, and the Officer Training Unit continued until 1973. And then, finally, the final organised use was the Hawkesbury Agricultural College, which uh, came and started using this place as a campus from around 1977 to about 1983. Uh, a lot of other uses were proposed until finally it became a national park in 1999. So that's the chronology. I would just like to now uh, invite Her Excellency, the Governor of New South Wales, up here to give the keynote address. And certainly anything to do with those of our veterans, and of course, as of the call, and an integral part of the spirit. Australia. Well, we certainly uh, have a great tradition. The governors of New South Wales have this wonderful area for the very first months When the New South Wales colony was in his quest for suitable land for farming, got in a rowing boat with a few of his men, rowed up the coast of Sydney.
seeds were sown, if I might use that analogy, here at Scarborough. Well, following the war, the post-war migration not only demonstrated a country which was determined to enter a new era, to grow anew, but welcomed people from other lands, many of whom had suffered in Europe from the terrible effects of the policies of the Nazis. And that experience, of course, has enriched Australia in wonderful ways from which we are still benefiting. Well, there's one thing that um, stands out about Skyville through all its major phases of use. It's always been a place that's adapted to change, a place intended to make a personal transformation to all those people who came here. Uh, not only from farming and officers training, immigrants, many, many thousands of people have passed through these very, very precincts to go on and build Australia towards the great nation that it is today. Those young men, I think of them frequently because my real profession in life is that of a doctor working with teenagers. And I think of those youngsters who came from cities like Birmingham or London, probably frightened to have been sent so far away, who emerged as still skilled farm workers and fine Australians who went across the state and did so much. So it's great to be here today and say thank you to them too for what they have done. Whole families came to this place in the hope of a new life, leaving with a new language and certainly making the will to make a contribution.